Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, okay, we're getting there. <laughs> uh, welcome back after lunch to the uh, afternoon plenary. Uh, we focused on this afternoon plenary on urban health pathways. So we've had, I'm, I'm Tolu Oni, I'm um, moderating the session. That's all you need to know. Um, <laughs> um, so I, uh, after this morning's plenary, we had a plenary this morning on transforming urban environments for health. But the question is, how do we do that, right? So there's one thing, there's one aspect to know what we need to do, but the pathway to getting it done is really critical. And we know this path is not linear, right? So we're working in urban complex systems. So it's a real privilege to have with us four esteemed um, speakers today to shed some light on, on these pathways. And no pressure, but you know, after this, that, that pathway will just be entirely clear to everyone here. So we will start off with a little bit of setting the scene, recognizing the pathways um, are not linear. So a little bit about systems, systems thinking, and why it's so critical to have that as a as a as a fundamental aspect of uh, our efforts to to tackle urban health challenges. Uh, this will be followed by two use cases, so case uh, studies from different parts of the world on leveraging data in AI and the focus on service delivery, um, particularly on NCD prevention in the context of, um, in general, in the context of COVID. And then lastly, we will bring it all home, right, Raul? Um, and to uh, consider the, the concept of the exposome, so really applying um, the systems approach to tangible examples to think about how the different exposures in urban environments influence our health. So. Are you ready? Fantastic. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Audrey de Nazelle. Um, Audrey is a senior lecturer at the Center for Environmental Policy at Env Imperial College London. She chairs the International Society on Environmental Epidemiology Policy Committee, and she works at that intersection of environmental sciences, health behavior, transportation, and, and urban planning with a view to guiding uh, decision makers uh, towards health promoting uh, built environments. And she particularly focuses on the determinants and impact of, 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 of travel behavior. So Audrey, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the stage. Welcome. Thank you very much. That's true, and I, 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 I did not coordinate, but I think we are- Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that deserves a round of applause. Thank you. Yes. You said to start us off, I uh, want to uh, talk about systems thinking in the way that we approach uh, decision making for uh, promoting more healthy uh, cities. And we're looking to look at multiple pathways to health, in particular with a focus on active travel. So, why do we need uh, systems thinking? Uh, well, I think we've heard it enough uh, again and again and again. Uh, we all know how decisions typically are made with very narrow-minded approach and siloed approaches to decision-making. I don't think I need to repeat that. We, uh, uh, When it comes to things like climate change or air pollution, we tend to have just that one target, would be, which would be reaching an air pollution standard or uh, reaching a target of uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction without thinking that there are actually multiple ways to get there. And then those other ways might generate multiple other benefits, might have feedback effects, uh, might have unintended consequences. So uh, what happens when you have that siloed thinking approach? Well, typically uh, for air pollution, climate change solutions, we come up with this kind of design. This is how we see the future of our cities going. This is what's going to save us, save the world, get us out of this uh, air pollution and, and climate change, change uh, quagmire, quagmire. This is what comes out of this silo thinking. And it, of course, uh, if you think about it, uh, once we've replaced every single one of those cars with another car, but a different engine in it, are we seriously going to be much better off? 
or can we do much better than that? And instead of getting people into a different kind of a car, we can just get them entirely out of their cars and then reap the benefits of all the transformations that can happen when we've uh, reduced our reliance on cars and encourage people to walk, bike, take public transportation. So you're gonna say, of course, it's a no brainer. We all know this is, uh, this is what needs to be happening, but the problem is why is it not happening? So I've been thinking a lot about what is it that we can do to get uh, much more transformational types of policies and, ur and urban policies uh, when we try to target things like climate change or air pollution. And so reviewing the literature to try to understand this, I've uh, come up with pretty much what you've heard already for the past day and a half, which is there are very much three types of pillars uh, that can uh, be influenced, that, that can explain both uh, enablers and barriers to integrating health in our policy decision making. And those, those uh, pillars are uh, institutional arrangements, um, political will and leadership, and then uh, ev the evidence base. And of course, they're all interrelated. I'm gonna mostly focus now uh, talking about some of this evidence base and trying to understand what we can do, what kind of evidence base we can develop that embraces that complexity of the real world of decision-making processes so that we can influence both those institutional arrangements and the way we make our decisions and also influence uh, the political will, the leadership and push for more, much more transformation solutions than what we tend to get these days. So I'm going to show you a few examples of the type of research that might demonstrate this. And my first example is a, a health impact modeling study that we did in London on assessing uh, transportation policies that address air pollution. So again, so there we looked at all the different types of policies that were in the works, that were in the strategy to address air pollution. And then we did develop some that were a bit more ambitious. Uh, this is work that, uh, that I did with my PhD student, Andrea Calderon. So we looked at all those different policies, and uh, we looked at uh, two different uh, groupings of policies. One were the technological solutions, such as the low emission zones, the electrifying uh, different types of vehicles, or electri electri electrifying the entire vehicle fleet. And we compared these to uh, behavioral uh, solutions that all had something to do with encouraging walking, cycling, and public transportation. So modal shifts away from cars into those active travel modes. And we looked at uh, two different kinds of health impacts in terms of mortality avoided. And these health impacts were in the blue bars there, uh, the impacts to changes in air pollution, and in the yellow bars there, the impacts in terms of changes in physical activity. So lo and behold, of course, when you look at, uh, look at those, uh, those impacts in terms of number of deaths avoided, uh, the technological scenarios obviously don't have any of those physical activity benefits. And so if you look at any of those behavioral solutions, uh, they are all two to 15 times better, have greater benefits than the most ambitious of all technological solutions, which is electrifying the entire vehicle fleets. So clearly, if we start looking at multiple impacts rather than just in our siloed way saying, what our goal is, our goal is just to reach an air, air pollution standard. If we look at variety of impacts, we can see how some solutions appear suddenly a lot more desirable than others. Another example, uh, first of all, when when we when we take people out of their cars and uh, and promote walking, cycling, public transportation, of course, we have benefits on on physical activity, air pollution. But think also of all the other types of benefits: fewer, fewer cars, much less noise, uh, all the space that's then left. Uh, open for much better uses, uh, public spaces. We've heard a lot about the importance of public spaces, playgrounds, areas for kids to play, and green space. So we can't necessarily quantify all those benefits yet, but I want to show you another example of uh, some other work that I've done uh, with another student where we looked at quantifying all the multiple types of benefits uh, from those uh, transportation strategies uh, using models that are almost off the shelf that are user friendly that we can use and so that we can start developing this kind of models that could be used uh, for different decision makers around the world. So what we found uh, in this case, I'm looking at uh, different transportation scenarios. This one was uh, shifting 50% of the traffic in London to walking, cycling and public transportation. And we're again looking at mortality uh, impacts, so number of deaths avoided. In red here, we have the benefits from physical activity uh, as, in, as in the other one. Here we have the benefits uh, 
from uh, air pollution reduction. Again, the same thing that you would have uh, you would have expected. Here, uh, we also included noise, so benefits from noise. And then finally, we modeled the impacts of, in our scenario, all the parked cars were replaced that were uh, uh, reduced in our scenario of 50% reduction. All those parked cars were replaced by a tree. And so we could actually measure the, the quantify the potential benefits from the green space as well. So I think when we, again, we look at those multiple types of benefits that can be quantified, I think we can start create, uh, creating alliances across groups, showing different departments. This is what you can obtain uh, in terms of health benefits. But, you know, of course, there are mul multiple other types of benefits can, that can be created. So I think those types of, uh, of models can be used as ways to bring in collaborate, collaborate Vibrations, is, which is what, what we know is very much needed across sectors. Again, multiple other types of impacts and benefits uh, we can expect from uh, walking, cycling uh, uh, strategies, getting people out of their cars. And some of them can be quantified in terms of number of deaths avoided, but also we have to be thinking about in the end, what we need to do is convince uh, citizens convince the public, convince decision makers. And those number of deaths avoided don't necessarily do the trick. They might help a little bit, but we also need to bring the public behind us and trying to engage them in something that's desirable. And so I think we need to be thinking a lot more because of this process of having to, to, to push for this, uh, those transformational solutions. What is it that we can do to engage the public? So just a few examples of, of the type of studies that might be more engaging, and there's a lot more that can be done in that area. Uh, some of these are difficult to quantify, but something like stress, I think people think of living in cities as something that's the epitome of stress. So m m people are typically very engaged with this idea of how we can reduce stress. So we've seen in, some, in this uh, study, uh, uh, this European project called PASTA, we looked at uh, objective data and uh, perceived data. This here, I'm, I'm looking at showing you some results of our objective data analysis on stress. And what we see is that um, uh, people who cycle uh, have a 11% reduction in stress compared to any other, activity, other activities. People who walk, while they're walking, they have a 5% reduction uh, in stress compared to other activities. Well, those people in, in uh, motorized transport increase a tiny bit, but a statistically significant increase their stress. So maybe not a, a, a earth shaking in terms of, of public health impacts that can be quantified, but perhaps something that can be engaging to the public. And that's something I think we need to be thinking about a lot more. Something else that uh, we might engage people, something else that people struggle with other than stress is body uh, weight, uh, body mass index or weight. What we see again from the PASTA study is uh, people uh, who bike, the more they bike, the lower their, their BMI. People who drive, the higher their BMI. And if you look at the difference between the two, it's about a four kilogram uh, difference. And if you look at longitudinal data, um, we see that uh, for people who biked, the more they biked, the more they reduced their uh, their weight. People who were stable, frequent cyclists also a cyclist also reduced their weight. So again, something that can be used as a form of engagement, getting people excited about the the future, and getting people excited about uh, about changes in their built environments that might uh, that they might then want to engage their own policymakers towards. It's uh, and maybe it's not data. It's actually a vision because in the end, what we need is to show a positive vision, have a give a sense of people that it's not about sacrifice. It's about something we want, that we are hopeful about, that we want to see. And sometimes something like visuals is, and stories is the best way to do that. So I think as researchers, we need to think a lot more about these different ways of engaging people. So this is Fleet Street in London, currently a, a street full of traffic. This is what it could look like, and maybe that's what we need to be doing. Doing a lot more is showing that kind of visualizations. So uh, I, I know I don't have time to talk about unintended consequences, and I would love to, but I'm put it there just to say, let's have a discussion later if we can, because I think it's so important. Uh, just to wrap things up, multiple code benefits, multiple types of trade-offs coming from different uh, uh, types of urban policies. I've only touched upon a few, but the key thing to me is, yes, we can uh, not only quantify these, show them how they're all related, but let's think especially about what it is that's going to be engaging to uh, stakeholders, to members of the public. Let's think about how we can create alliances across sectors, how we can create collaborations, how we can reach people's values and objectives so that we can engage people much more fully. So um, 
Thank you very much. Very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Audrey. Do you know, let's take, if you, does anyone have a burning question for Audrey before the next? We're going to have a discussion at the end, but if there's something that you think, oh, I don't want to forget. Yes, one question over there. Yeah, my question is, I always think about it, you know, the benefits of transition from a normal build to no, no, I didn't see well. It is probably easier. Oh, thank you. It is probably easier to make the argument about the economic benefit at the individual level, but at the industry level, there's implications. Mm -hmm. You know, people are employed by the automobile industry. So, what is your thinking as you? Or trying to make the case for let's do this, but without putting people's livelihoods at stake too. Because you know, auto industry is big. I'm from the United States, and it's one of the biggest industries in, in, in that country. So what are your thoughts and, and ideas and how to navigate those uh, issues? thinking approach and I can uh, expand on that, but there are- Hang on, uh, hang on. Yeah. You can't hear me? Go, sure. go on, yeah. go on. It. Okay. So that's that's why that systems thinking approach is needed is so that you can look at all these, these uh, those not, the potential unintended consequences, how you deal with it. So there are lots of other kind of uh, unintended consequences and I'm, I'm, I'd be delighted to to talk about, uh, about multiple ones. Uh, yes, of course, we need to be thinking about that, about alternatives. What are the alternatives to these industries? I mean, we do have examples like in, in Holland where they have a thriving automobile industry and they have, have very walkable cities. So it's not as if you can, or a bikeable cities. Now, they still probably have to, uh, too much driving in the Netherlands and maybe <laughs> rule can say something about that in a bit. Uh, but it does, they don't necessarily go against each other. But also, I think there's other ways of creating jobs. Uh, we don't, uh, you know, we don't have to necessarily rely on the automobile industry to rely uh, to develop jobs. And I think we need to be thinking about how we need to get ourselves out of a system that we've been locking ourselves in with things like having relying on automobile industry for livelihood. I mean, there's, there's, and, and when you push for things such as electric uh, vehicles, you're doing exactly that. You're just locking ourselves in into one more type of industry, more vested interest as infrastructure, a system. So I think those are things that we really need to be thinking about. And that's why I'm saying we definitely need that system thinking. There are lots of questions, but I, I, I know, you, it, yes, exactly. we'll, we will have a discussion <laughs> on the end. I just wanted to get Sorry. a little bit of interaction, um, but, uh, but Thank hold you. on to that. I will come to you first after at the end i promise um but that's a that's a really excellent question because we could also look at some of the playbook uh experiences for in public health from things like sugar you know sugar tax and the the, the effect on industry and some of the the um, you know pivoting industry in industry action and that sort of thing so there's opportunity to learn from different sectors so we've got one one question uh for the end already um but secondly, uh, I would like to welcome, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Anne Earps to come speak. Anne is the head of Novartis Foundation, an organization committed to transform the health of low-income populations, leveraging the power of data, technology, uh, and artificial intelligence to reimagine health and care around the world. Anne holds a degree in medicine, a master's in public health, from the University of Leuven in Belgium, and a degree in tropical medicine from the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp. She chairs the Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development working, working group on digital and AI and health, and is a member of the board of uh, Phillips Foundation and the Institute of Tropical Medicine. She serves as a member of the US National Academy, um, Academies of Medicine's Commission on Healthy Longevity and was named one of the top 50 innovators in 2020 by the World Health World Summit AI community. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ertz.
Thank you, Tolu, for the nice introduction and uh, congratulations, Audi, with your fantastic research. I learned a lot. I will take my bike from now on. So um, it's a real pleasure to be here with you today and talk about how data, um, digital technology and artificial intelligence can really uh, transform the way we address urban health. In fact, we've seen that COVID has put the spotlight on the, on the problems, the global health challenges we were already facing, be it the inversion of the uh, aging pyramid or the rapid urbanization that came together with increasing inequities and that together with the total inadequacy of our current health systems to address all those health challenges. However, COVID also brought enormous opportunities. It brought this unprecedented collaboration. What we saw in the beginning of the pandemic with the speed of the development of the vaccine, the distribution of the vaccine, the administration of the vaccine was also quite extraordinary. The um, virtual took over our lives during the beginning of the pandemic and in the entire duration of the pandemic, we made leaps forward in the use of virtual health and care services, something that had been hanging behind the other sectors. And next to that, we saw that cities could really be drivers of uh, population health. Because we saw that during the COVID um, epidemic, which was completely data driven, we saw that data driven decision making became a factor of success when you were a politician in general, not everywhere, but in general. And we saw that in cities, COVID hit hardest. So this is the best place to start to really transform the way we think about urban health, about population health, and transform our health systems from being these reactive care systems that wait for people to get sick and treat them when they come, to become proactive, predictive, and ultimately preventive so that they can keep their populations healthy. That kind of population health approach was the one we took a several, a several years ago at the Novartis Foundation. We started an innovative population health approach called CARDIO, and CARDIO is an acronym that stands for um, all these different things you see here on the slide. But A, for example, stands for accelerating the access to diagnosis, because most people in low and middle income settings are simply not diagnosed for cardiovascular disease, for example. Cardiovascular risk is asymptomatic. So you, you would be living for years with high blood pressure or high cholesterol and only get diagnosed when you present with a heart attack or a stroke. So accelerating and optimizing access to diagnosis was the first step forward. The R stands for introducing policies with proven impact on health, whether that would have been tobacco taxes or sugar taxes, it depended on the city where we were. The D, everything we did was driven by data and digital technology. So we measured everything we did so that we could validate the approach we took and demonstrate its impact on the health outcomes and the health um, impact. You will hear more about that tomorrow from my colleague, Teresa Reicher, who will present cardio for cities, the whole approach and its results in a presentation tomorrow morning at 10.30. So you're all welcome there as well. The I, obviously, this was a multi-sector, multidisciplinary partnership. And the O is the most important letter, which stands for local ownership. The local city authorities were in the driver's seat, co-designing, co-creating this approach together with us based on data-driven decision-making. And I tell you, as you were alluding to as well, Audley, this data-driven decision-making, it doesn't happen overnight. It really takes a mindset shift. But when it's there, it's really successful. I give you the results of one of our cities, Sao Paulo in Brazil. Um, I think the population is about 15 million, right, Marcelo? I think more or less 15 million. In one year of implementation, we were able to triple blood pressure control rates in a public health system that is functioning pretty well because Brazil has a year long standing policy for primary health care and, and family health. 
in that public health system, we were able to transform it because we offered results regularly to the, to the local decision makers to redesign interventions where they were needed, where they needed at the diagnostic side or at the long-term uh, follow-up side. It depended on uh, what we saw in the different data. Tripling blood pressure control rates in the population of Sao Paulo, it was translated in a reduction of up to 13% of strokes in one year time. Imagine how many lives that is in a population of 15 million. So this very successful approach, Cardio for Cities, is here validated open for any partner who wants to replicate it in any city around the world. So we're working together with several agencies to now replicate this and make it available as much as possible to any authority who wants. But at the Novartis Foundation, we want to take this one step further. Because as I told you in the beginning, these inequities were already existing in health. But we didn't see them so much as we see them now. They are ubiquitous. Inequities everywhere. And data is everywhere as well. So data is an opportunity we have to grab by the fact that we live in this era with massive computational power and great data science expertise. What can we do better than use the data to understand what is really driving our health in cities? And that is what we set out to do at the Novartis Foundation in partnership with Microsoft AI for Health, who bring the massive computational power, who bring the data scientists and uh, city authorities around the world. We really want to make sure that we understand, is it the health system performance or is it the housing or is it the access to healthy options such as healthy food or physical exercise? Is it the insecurity? What is it that makes people having unequal health outcomes? We want to challenge the existing reality where as you learned this morning from David in the, in the first panel, in New York, you can live in one zip code. If you are living there, you have a 25% higher risk of experiencing a stroke than if you live in a neighboring zip code. Or a baby born in one zip code may have an 11 years different life expectancy of a baby born in a neighboring zip code. That reality is unacceptable. So for this AI for Healthy Cities um, initiative, we go to the data-rich cities, where our Cardio for Cities initiative had been implemented in low- and middle-income settings, ranging over the three different southern continents, be it uh, Latin America, Africa, or Asia. We now also include data-rich cities such as New York City, Lisbon here next door, Lausanne in Switzerland, and soon also Singapore and Helsinki, to bring together existing data existing data from both the health sector and other sectors, health influencing sectors, the food sector, housing sector, transportation sector, anything that is important in different cities, we will bring those data together, put them in the machines of Microsoft and let the machines tell us what is it that really drives most our health in the population level, not at an individual level, but at a population level. Because we hope to deliver decision makers in cities, whether that's the mayor of Lisbon, who is extremely engaged in this initiative, or whether that's the mayor in New York, who really wants to address this as well, as equity has been at the center of the policy there. We want to give them the tools in their hands that they can better allocate either the resources to the, the sectors that need it most, or develop the right partnerships. As we heard also from you, Audi, you need to know which are the partners you first need to work with if you want to improve population health. So that is an initiative that we hope will deliver those data-driven insights and progress our understanding so that you don't have to live in different zip codes of the same city with different health outcomes anymore. That initiative, as it's just being launched and started, uh, will last for a few years, I guess, but I hope it will really contribute to our understanding. And that may help us then ultimately transform these health systems from being reactive care systems to become proactive, predictive, 
and preventive health systems that keep the populations healthy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. So it's great to have that first kind of example of of pathway, kind of applying the systems approach and using uh, using uh, digital um, technology and AI. So once again, any burning questions for Anne? Now you know there'll just be one, so it's high competition. Yes, we've got one over there. Just keep your hand up so they can see you. Thank you. Hello, yeah, very interesting work there. Um, I'm just interested in what kind of data are you utilizing um, from these different settings? Uh, is it, uh, well, provided, for example, by Microsoft itself, or is it personalized data, or the, what kind of data are you dealing here? Yeah. Thank you for the Shared question. Some, we use yeah. existing data, so we are not collecting currently prospective data. We use existing data. That's why we go to data rich cities. And in New York, for example, we have a collaboration with Health and Hospitals, which is the biggest public health system in the US and in New York as well. Um, and having those data combined with data from other sectors to then analyze by in the in the cloud, if you may, in the in the computational. Power. So it's different sources of data which have to be harmonized, but hopefully uh, bring us new insights. Okay. So I know lots of questions, but we'll come back to you. So we've got the first question there, we'll come back, and the second question there. Okay. Now you're testing my memory. Okay. Third speaker. Uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome Dr. Shamim Talugda who has been leading the non-governmental organization Eminence, Eminence Associates for Social De Development since its inception in 2003. He was the president of the International Society of Urban Health, which you may have heard of, um, in between 2015 and 2017. He's a key leader of the Bangladesh Urban Health Network um, as a, a member secretary since 2009. Uh, and uh, under his leadership, Eminence uh, Associates is recognized as an affiliate member of several international organizations, such as the International Diabetes Federation, the World Health Federation, and the International Epidemiological Association. Um, Dr. Talibka, um completed his medical degree at uh, Rajchahi Medical College in Bangladesh, a master's in philosophy uh, at the International Community, in, in, in International Community Health from Oslo University in Norway. And he's a keen interest in implementing uh, community-based programs through different, uh, applying different innovative uh, ideas and approaches. So it's a pleasure to welcome um, Dr. Talibda to tell us a little bit from the systems uh, delivery perspective, service delivery. Thank you. Thank you. I, I uh, personally, you know, see this presentation as a, you know, opportunity to uh, give an, you know, uh, understanding about my country, Bangladesh, as well as the role of civil society and what is the success we have already achieved in this health sector, as well as what we can do. Uh, that's why, you know, I put my presentation as a service delivery and the opportunity for the system approach to, to tackle the challenges, especially focused on the non-communicable disease in the primary health care of Bangladesh. Um, I think you, most of you know about Bangladesh, but let me you know, give again, introduce about this Bangladesh. Bangladesh is a small country, but we have lots of population. You know, if you go to Bangladesh, it's a country of human beings. Uh, so it's about 165 million people, and it is one of the highly densely populated country in this world. Uh, and as an administrative structure, we have a division. It's about 12 city corporation. There are four sit, you know, metropolitan city. There are municipality like 327. There are 64 districts, Upojela, then ground level like union, ward, and villages. And um, if you look at that, you know, R1 population is almost about you know 40 percent at this moment of the total population uh, 
though we predicted that in 2035, it will be 50% of the total population will be the urban, but at this moment, it is already 40%. So maybe we'll, you know, reach the target of the 50% of the urban population before the 2035. And uh, we have a very young group of population. It is about 45 million people. And in the Dhaka city, which is a mega city and capital city of our country, that is 10.2 million uh, uh, people. And slum dwellers is about 1.8 million. And if you go to Dhaka, you will find that everywhere is slums. And you know there are lots of scattered people. Those are you know living in a very uh, underprivileged uh, situation. As per you know climate change issues, I can give you a very interesting you know data. Like one of our division, which is Borishal, who which is mainly affected by the climate change and environmental issues, and in the last two decades in that division, there is no population growth. Due to this climate change, you know, most of the people, uh, 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 they migrate in the urban areas. So internal migration is one of our major challenges for the urban health services. And interestingly, government has a lots of healthcare services, mainly focused on the, you know, uh, poor, our, uh, rural people, which is implemented by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Uh, those people, those are migrating in the urban areas and living in the slums, they're not getting any services because there is a lack of you know, urban primary healthcare services. If you look at the health status at this moment, it is about life expectancy 72 year, maternal mortality ratio is, uh, rate is 167 per thousand live births, infant mortality 21, uh, neonatal mortality 15, under five mortality 34.2, skilled birth attendance is uh, 42. Just I'm just going to give in our success, some success in terms of the immunization coverage. It's almost 97% immunization coverage in our country. And uh, DPT3 immunization is uh, like 97 and valid vaccine coverage is 82.3%. And if you look at that, you know, the black doctors, physician, that is very little bit, you know, scarcity, like physician density per thousand population is 0.472. Interestingly, nurse number is half compared to the doctors. It is about like 0.27. So, you know, we have half uh, nurses for the doctors. So one doctor usually get a half you know, uh, nurses. Uh, if you look at that, you know, uh, expenditure of the health persons for uh, gross domestic products, it is 2.8, very, very minimum uh, investment for the health sector and private, sec you know, out of the pocket expenditure we found, it is 72.1%. So people are paying lots of money uh, uh, in terms of the health service uh, 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 in our country. But if you look at what is the government is doing, Government, the last, you know, from 2000 uh, to 2021 in 21 years, they have increased the budget, but still it is, you know, around 2% of our total GDP. Uh, its uh, amount is increasing, but it is not, you know, really uh, uh, expected. Uh, for a proper healthcare services. Uh, but if you look at that in you know, the transition of our, uh, 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 of our health uh, in terms of the mortality, then you know, if I say that you know, two decades ago, our main causes of the death was infectious disease, diarrhea, or other you know, pneumonia and other diseases. But if, for the last one decade, we found that it is transited into the non-communicable disease is one of the major causes of the death. And it's about 67% people are dying for the non-communicable disease. And in 2009, stroke was the major causes for the uh, you know, death. And 2019 is still number one cause. Ischemic heart disease is the second. Uh, neonatal disorder, it was third, but now in 2009, it has become the fourth. Lower respiratory infection was four, now it is five. COPD, it was five, now it is three. Uh, tuberculosis, diarrheal disease, it is at the lower grade. If you look at diabetes, it is it was nine, now it is six. Uh, so, you know, non-communicable uh, disease is one of the major threat and, you know, uh, challenges for the healthcare services. Let me, you know, uh, look at the uh, risk factor. Malnutrition is one of our major problem, and it is a double burden of the malnutrition. We have undernutrition, as well as we have the overnutrition problem too. And among the women, uh, is more than 35. It is about 50% women are, you know, obese. 
So there is a big challenges. And if you look at that, you know, children, there is a high number of malnutrition is still, you know, uh, existing. So in that perspective, you know, healthcare system is a big challenges in our country. And uh, for urban services, I'm just giving you a structure that how uh, our government is providing the healthcare services in urban areas. So this is a uh, uh, Minister of Health is providing these services, as well as Minister of Local Government also providing the services for the uh, urban people. And under the Minister of Health, there is a you know, health service division. There is another division for medical education and family planning division. Then under the health service division, district hospital, Upojela Union, as well as community clinic up to the root level for 6,000 people, uh, uh, people are getting the primary health care services. Um, uh, if you look at that, you know, Ministry of Local Government, they are they also have a development, urban development doing, and urban development doing, there is a project for the last two, more than 20 years, they are implementing that project, which is called Urban Primary Healthcare Service uh, Delivery Program. Then Poroshova Health Service and City Corporation also their own hospital and pharmacy uh, to provide these healthcare services. But what is happening, if you look at that NCDs, hypertension, you know, uh, that uh, it was in 2011, 32% among the, you know, women, now it is 45. So this data, like, you know, for hypertension and diabetics, I don't see it as a, you know, as a disease pattern, how it is, you know, increasing. Also, uh, uh, to, you know, requesting you to look at the lens of the gender perspective. If you look at the gender perspective, there is women is the most, you know, vulnerable uh, for this non-communicable disease. And interesting, I did not uh, share here about the cancer, uh, reproductive age group women, they're the highest cause for the death is cancer. You know, there is a huge number of breast cancer as well as the, you know, cervical cancer and they are dying. And we don't have any, you know, community-based data for the cancer. So there is a big need of the, you know, uh, 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 look at this NCD services in our country, especially for the poor people. And what is happening for hypertension or diabetics? Two thirds of the population, they are not aware about that they have this type of, you know, diseases. Those that are aware, only one third they're taking the, you know, treatment for their you know condition, and among those are taking the treatment, one third have the you know control for diabetes and hypertension. So there's a, there's a huge population. Those are uh, you know not under the treatment. They don't aware about this treatment, and you know that has a long term in you know perspective. There's a big. Uh, uh, complication for them. And nowadays you will find that everywhere in Bangladesh, there is a you know, open heart surgery hospital and people are going to the hospital and taking their you know, bulb or some other uh, treatment. Uh, in that perspective, just I'm just going to give you a success stories of the COVID-19. Um, uh, during the COVID-19, we have control very interesting way, and there is a big success for our country, uh, especially for the poor people too. Um, it was about 14.9 million lab tests we carried out, 2 million we confirmed of the cases, 1.9 million uh, uh, recovered, and 29,000 people died, and 0.4 million isolated, and 12.30 million second dose already administered. Because we have a you know some sort of capacity to provide the immunization. We have a track record of you know, success story of the immunization system. Uh, and it is a multi-sectoral you know, uh, engagement for providing these services. So in that case, you know, COVID-19 vaccination, we have really uh, done a very good job. Uh, in that perspective, I think that you know, uh, as NCD is uh, increasing, uh, climate change effect on the health and double burden of malnutrition we need to consider as a challenge. Then urban primary health care, uh, which is provided by the Ministry of Health and uh, Ministry of Local Government, they need to focus on the uh, maternal nutrition and child health and family planning. They also need to focus on the NCD services. As you know, uh, ministry, uh, both ministries providing the service that is only 5% coverage. So we need to increase this coverage and focus on the non-communicable disease. And as out of the pocket expenses is 72% and drugs price has increased, you know, recently after the COVID it is a very, you know, beyond the, you know, excess uh, uh, regarding the drugs price. So we need to work on that issue too. Uh, finally, uh, I think that, you know, we have the existing like pharmacies all over the country, especially in the urban areas. Uh, that is pharmacy we can utilize as an existing infrastructure 
for providing the primary healthcare services uh, 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 for for poor people especially. And we also think that you know private sector in Bangladesh there is about thirty thousand you know uh, pharmacies and uh, the, um, clinic as well as you know three hundred thousand pharmacies. So this you know, uh, private clinic, we can engage like 60% services provided by the private clinic. And during the COVID-19, we found that there is a new, you know, company came up uh, for telemedicine services. It was like before the COVID, it was seven telemedicine companies. Now it is 162 telemedicine company. They are providing the services. That is a new innovative way we can engage them for the primary health care services. And health insurance uh, should be uh, in place uh, to ensure the, you know, universal health coverage. Uh, I'm going to stop here. I'm sure that, you know, as your audience here, uh, maybe, you know, uh, Bangladesh and other uh, representative of the developing countries needs your, you know, uh, thoughtful thinking and support to take forward out of the, you know, urban health care, especially for the poor people to ensure the equity uh, uh, in this world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shamim. So many intersections there, right, in terms of thinking about health. It's so striking. On the one hand, you talk about a very young population and then to see over a 10-year period the trajectory of the increase in, in NCDs, in uh, preventable conditions in the young population. So lots of links that need to be made there with primary, primary health care. So thank you for that. Um, again, you know the drill by now. You're forfeiting your uh, your uh, your additional question. <laughs> I have two questions. Okay. Uh, first, I... <laughs> just uh, just for Shamim, right? Uh, no, I one. No, no, no. We're just taking questions oh, for Shamim. First, 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 Doctor yeah. Shamim. Yeah. Actually, I am Ramratan. I am from India, Patna, Bihar. Sir, actually, your lower respiratory infection have increased four percent to five percent. So, what would the impact of the IMR? IMR is still on 21. So, what would the IM effect of IMR? And second is the DPT is 82.3 and full immunization is 97%. So, what is the relation between that full immunization versus DPT? And uh, is there any uh, vitamin A supplementation for uh, uh, to prevent IMR? Uh yeah. Sorry, can, can you just can you just spell out your because we're in an interdisciplinary space. So when you say IMR, maybe just spell out what you mean. Uh, infant mortality rate. IMR is the infant okay. mortality rate. Actually, okay. what happened in Bangladesh? Lower respiratory tract infections yeah. have you. increased from four to five percent. Four percent, five percent. Whatever he has seen the slide. Yeah. So I just I want to make you what is the impact on the IMR? What is it, it's being increased? So they decrease. So and. Uh, I want to pass uh, Mr. Okay, what is the what, how Bangladesh is implementing this? Yeah, uh, in terms of the infant mortality rate that is uh, increased in the last five years time, you know, like this data I have presented here for the Bangladesh Demographic and Health Survey, and it's uh, due to the you know some sort of like if you look at that uh, during the COVID time, the last two years there was a very minimum services they got for you know in uh, uh, different type of immunization as well as the you know primary care for the children especially for the neonate uh, people so that is the causes uh, for this you know imr increasing and in terms of the dpt coverage like i said the dpt coverage is a uh, 97% but all other vaccination coverage is 87 point some percent because for in full immunization we we count dpt also sir but sir this data is uh, uh, before covid uh, yeah after covid what is the covid covid duration also been included in that oh, uh, like you know most of the data i shared uh, here from the Bangladesh Demographic and Health Survey, and recently, 2022, the health bulletin is published by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. So that is the data I took it from that bulletin too. So I have to take it. So Thank you. Thank I you. Have a second, a first no, first. no, we're going to take that one question, and we'll come back at the end just to keep I, us on track. Important with uh, London. No, when we come back. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, the last question, because your your question might evolve. You see, when you hear the last the last one, so I'm going to to keep keep us keep us moving so final um uh speech uh from professor 
Rol Vermeulen. Yes, I got it. Um, Rol is a professor of environmental epidemiology and exposome science at the Institute for Risk Assessment Sciences at Utrecht University and at the Julia Center for Health Sciences and Primary Care, um, also at Utrecht. He is the director of the Institute for Risk Assessment Sciences at Utrecht University, and his research focuses on environmental risk factors for cancer, cardiometabolic and neurological diseases, um, applying inter and transdisciplinary research. And one of his main research areas, which we'll hear about, is exploring new methods for quantifying uh, the external and internal exposome across the life course. So we're going to bring bring together that kind of system thinking uh, and uh, into the thinking about the different urban urban exposures. Thank you, Rol. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today, and um, welcome to to you all. And I'm. Really looking forward to have a discussion. I don't want to be in between uh, questions and, and the panel. So I'm <laughs> going to try to keep it uh, as short as possible. Um, but I'm here basically as a, a scientist talking about urban health. And perhaps I'm here to um, the stakes a little bit as a word science, a scientist, as a word citizen. Uh, because when I hear basically these talks, we basically are facing large problems today, basically, when we look at urban health. If we just think about the fact that we, the cost um, that is increasing uh, by health in healthcare is basically rapidly outpacing the increase in GDP. If we think basically that in the Netherlands, for instance, we have one in seven people working in healthcare, uh, basically in 2040, that's gonna be one in four. So if you just take this audience, you have to realize that a quarter of you will actually be there to support the other um, three quarters of the, the population. So these are really unsustainable aspects that we are facing. They're compounded by the fact that we actually have a climate crisis, we have an energy crisis, and we actually have a few opportunities um, in the future to take decisions and to make them right. And that's where really Audrey's plea for transformative change comes in. And that means that we have to think about interdisciplinary transdisciplinary work and see really how together we can actually get these transformative chains uh, basically globally. I'm going to talk today about um, a system approach to urban health and talk about the exposome. And I'm going to take um, pretty much a data-driven approach. And just as a disclaimer, that's not that I believe that data-driven approaches are the end all of actually getting to the right answer. Um, we develop methods that may be useful to actually get transformative change and to aid basically policy makers in making decisions. Uh, but I think processes like co-creation, um, working basically with different stakeholders is hugely important. Um, I think this is something that, that we all realize, but this is just um, from the uh, National Public Health uh, Department in, in the Netherlands, the RFEM, um, of basically what is the contribution of different determinants of the burden of disease. And um, when we take a very... Um, small view of the environment, we could say basically, well, there's about 4% of the burden of disease or um, that's basically attributable to, to environment. And sometimes this is used by policymakers to say, well, the environment is actually not that important, right? Because in the end, basically lifestyle, uh, behavior, metabolic aspects are basically determining health much more than the environment. But something is wrong in that vision, because if we actually think about the complex system, how our urban form, the way that we actually physically or socially have designed our society, basically is determining the risk factors that we observe. May that be air pollution, may that be um, social um, or lack of social cohesion, um, may that be bad water quality. It all comes basically from the way that we physically and societally actually have organized our societies. And if we think about that, then actually urban form is actually contributing a lot to behavior and to a lot of the metabolic diseases that we actually observe. And so also when we think about prevention, it's not only about lifestyle prevention, um, but it is about coming up with structural changes in the environment that actually would support people to actually exhibit uh, healthy behaviors. And that's not only basically um, thinking about the physical environment that also has a lot to do with social capital and so on. 
Um, so when we actually think about what the urban um, reform is actually um, contributing to health, then we actually can say that a large part of actually the non-communicable disease um, crisis that we observe today um, is basically in some way related to this urban form and urban design. And that's why I'm looking forward to the discussion here to really think about, okay, what is then basically the options that we have to actually change um, these urban environments? So what I'm going to do in um, the next few slides is basically to take you through a few of the data solutions for evidence-based urban planning. Uh, we have heard basically that, you know, we would like to go to this evidence-based planning. It's something that policymakers want. And we want basically to have this framework in which we actually can say, okay, if I take decision A, is that gonna give me more benefit at the long-term or short-term than if I take option B and what are the trade-offs between those? Because I only can spend my euro or my dollar or whatever coin only once. Um, so we have to actually have that integrated view. I will then go to um, take a step to say, okay, how can we then actually build decision support tools? So how can we actually make that knowledge actionable? Um, and the last step that I want to take is really at the, the forefront where we are in our institute to think then how can we actually make that even more dynamic by digital twinning? So um, you heard this word exposome coming up and, and this word exposome uh, was coined in 2004 by Chris Wilde, um, who then became the um, director of the Inst International Agency of Research of Cancer. Uh, and it was really because we were realizing and when we were looking at chronic diseases that a lot of emphasis and investments were done in understanding the genetic factors of disease, uh, but that same investment was not done for the non-genetic uh, factors of disease. And so we basically said, okay, by having this disbalance between those two fields, we really have to coin a term. And that's what we basically coined the term exposome to say this encompasses all non-genetic factors. And we have to realize that a lot of these factors that we're looking at may that be social or the physical chemical environment really have to do with the ecosystems that we live in and has a lot to do. And these ecosystems really determine also our lifestyle. So they're interconnected. You cannot really look at them at one exposure one disease, you actually have to look at them combined. So um, in essence, basically, that is basically looking at all these different stressors, may that be um, the uh, environmental stressor or social factors that we have. Now, um, you heard already about the, the Novartis um, project, um, but just to also tell you a little bit about the enormous resources that are being built up. So we have a lot of information about um, the environment, which I forgot to say basically here on the right side, but we also have a lot of information uh, when we think about um, health. And so what we actually have been able to do in Europe with our project, the Expanse project, but also other projects that are currently running within the European Human Exposome Network is to actually make available um, the health records in administrative cohorts. So that's about 55 million health records that we actually can link to all these urban and environmental variables to understand basically how are all these variables linked to different health outcomes. Um, we are also able to do that in um, adult cohorts where we follow people in time, where we have longitudinal data, um, and this now amounts to over 2 million people. Um, we also do that in mature birth cohorts to basically look at this life course aspect because a lot of the chronic diseases that we observe today are actually harbored in early life. So just as an example, um, CPD, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease that I'm working on, half of the cases that we actually observe in adulthood are actually caused early in life. It is because the lungs don't develop to full capacity in early life. A half of the other cases are basically because we have rapid decline afterwards. Um, the other resources that are there are basically our urban labs, and these are um, studies where uh, we follow about a thousand people um, to really understand how people interact with their environment. So they actually get sensors to measure air pollution. Uh, we also give them basically um, trackers to know where how they interact with their environment uh, and physical activity trackers. And we have a gamified app that basically together with the people co-designs the study to see basically what are their worries in their environment and how can we actually address those. All these resources that are put up here are open. So anybody that's here that has interesting questions or really wants to work with the data, please get in contact uh, with us. Um, just to see what that can do for us when we actually think about um, these complex interplay between variables. And this is 
work of um, Hakan Ozohanyan, one of my PhD students, um, that used a cohort in the Netherlands, uh, about 18,000 people, um, use basically all the urban variables that we have within our geospatial systems. Um, that's about 100 different aspects of the urban environment and basically ask the question, what is driving really an obesogenic environment? So what is really causing people, um, what's really causing obesity? Um, and just not to go too deep into the results, but this is basically what you would get. Um, and I've just grouped them basically in three categories. Um, you see that there are loads of social determinants. Um, there are physical, chemical, environmental uh, determinants, mostly air pollution. And we see that the food environment plays a role as well. And so you see that basically we cannot look at one system as, as one exposure at a time. We have to understand how all these factors actually have an interplay and how that actually would translate in urban design and changes. That's exactly what I wanted to talk about because it's really nice to have these very large data sets and to be able to really start to develop new knowledge and understand perhaps these complex systems and interactions between those variables. But in the end, of course, we have to make that uh, data not, uh, actionable. So how do we actually take that knowledge and make it actually actionable for um, the other stakeholders? And so here's where decision support tools um, come in. This is a neighborhood in, in Utrecht that I'm involved in as a living lab experiment. Um, this has been designed for people to live more five years longer in, in good health. Um, and you see actually these kind of uh, pictures more and more, right? We develop neighborhoods that are healthier, more social. Um, it's going to be the greatest neighborhood to move into. Um, these actually are the plans that we are developing now. And the question that comes up is basically, okay, um, how do we actually know that these neighborhoods are healthier? So interestingly, for sustainability, we actually have um, decision support tools that actually you would need to use to actually prove that what you're building is sustainable. We actually don't have that for, for health. If you develop a new neighborhood, there is no law at this moment, at least not in the Netherlands, that would actually determine that you develop a neighborhood that is healthier than what you would have done in the past. So we actually want to provide tools that actually would allow that. Now, there are decision support tools available if you think about what the impact is, basically, if you improve air quality, if you improve noise, uh, greenness, and physical activity. And these are some examples of tools and algorithms that are used, and Audrey showed some other work that, that has been done to really get these health impact assessments to understand, basically, what is the impact when we actually improve um, air quality, noise, or, or greenness. Uh, a very nice example of that is also... Oops, um, the work that is done by Mark Neuenhausen, um, and this is the ICE global uh, ranking of, of cities. Uh, what you see here is Valencia, right? And what you can see basically if Valencia would improve their air quality to the current WHO standards, um, that we basically would mean that um, 718 deaths, uh, when we think about PM 2.5, could be avoided by year. And so this gives an idea of basically, you know, if you do something, what actually would be the impact, which we also can translate to um, cost benefits. But the issue is that these decision support tools uh, help us to calculate scenarios of when we move to a certain target, meaning that we actually reach the WHO guidelines or that we actually get enough green in the environments but it doesn't link it yet to urban design. So that's really the part that is still missing. How do we actually make systems that allow us not to look at basically the end result, but allows us basically to study if we change this urban form, what would be the resultant in these stressors and what then actually would be the health implications of that and who is actually benefiting um, over somebody else. And so who really uh, benefits from the intervention? So this is really where the next item of um, tooling comes in. And there have been present presentations already here, I think about digital twinning and agent-based modeling uh, for urban interventions, uh, just to show where we are at the moment within uh, our project. And that's basically that we start using these um, multi-layered environmental information. Um, we basically then um, build synthetic populations. So these are basically uh, within the neighborhood or within the city of interest, uh, we actually give agents, people, uh, virtual people, uh, the attributes that are basically there in the neighborhood. So they have the same demographics. You even can link in the health records so that people have the same kind of health morbidities 
in that neighborhood that you actually are studying. So we can actually build up a synthetic population that actually would mimic the real population. The thing that really is novel in this agent-based modeling and also really the um, forefront of, 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 of the work is how do you then actually get behavior in? Because people have options, right? If we change mobility patterns, people can choose to do that or not. If we change the food environment, certain people would be influenced by, by that, but certain others not. And so we have to link in behavior and that's basically what we are working on now with AI models to build in these behavioral models so that we actually get dynamic systems that actually look uh, like this. Um, so this is the city of Amsterdam. Uh, what you see here is basically um, a, a population with a certain age distribution, uh, with a certain gender distribution. Um, they actually are um, over different model choices uh, based on the travel information we have from the city. We then basically have the models of air pollution and noise integrated. And you actually can start to make interventions into these digital twins to actually say, okay, we're gonna change mobility choices or we're gonna actually change the greening and see basically how is that affected. But actually having a synthetic population that is mimicking the neighborhoods and the city, it actually allows you also to see actually who gets the benefits. Um, and this is really important when we think about equity uh, because a lot of the interventions that we actually may produce may actually widen the um, gap in, in health instead of narrowing it. So these kind of models really help to do that. Uh, these kind of models um, also help to actually layer in different exposures because the urban form, as I pointed out in the writing example, is not only relating to noise or air pollution, but it's effect affecting many of the exposures within an urban environment. So what I, I wanted to give a plea for that at least part of the solution could be that um, we start to think about these data solutions, um, how we actually can create new knowledge uh, bring that together collectively um, to see how we can develop decision support tools and how we actually can get to digital twinning and ABMs, all basically to narrow the gap between science and basically urban planning and policymakers. If I look at the work that I'm involved in, we often get basically questions, how many trees should there be in a neighborhood? How wide should be basically the, 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 the walkway that we are on? And our scientific knowledge is not always basically on that level. And so we actually have to see how we actually can bridge between basically the needs of basically the policymakers and urban planners and the knowledge that we have. And this is one of the ways that we could uh, try to do that. So um, I just wanted to leave you with um, my credentials and some of the resources. I will put up the slides on Zenodo and, and put out basically the uh, DOI link so that you can actually get to the slides and go back to these resources. And i um, happy to have a discussion and um, hear more from you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, you did not. Uh disappoint. <laughs> okay, so we've heard all of the presentations. Maybe to um, keep the standard, I have one question for for Ro, and then we'll open it up for any of the any of the um, the talks you've heard earlier. So any specific question for Ro? Yes, over there. Now we've heard from you. We'll come back. Over there, please. To you. At the top. I'm a gateway to you. Uh, so. <laughs> have to spread the love. Um, thank you so much, Professor. That was just amazing. <laughs> um, I really appreciated you mentioning equity because as you were speaking about digital twinning and ABM, that was a concern of mine is what is stopping just sort of capital interests and organizations just really looking at you know, return on investments versus prioritizing equity. I was wondering if you could speak more to equity considerations in this work, um, especially with how indicators are crafted. Um, thanks for, very much for um, for the question. And I think um, this is an important topic because um, a lot of the toolings that, that we may develop or interventions may actually widen, widen that gap. Um, so for for our research, I mean, all these models are are open. So in that sense, I mean, we're we're not locked into to anything, to any platform, to any commercial provider. And so what we actually try to do is to democratize uh, the data as much as possible. That we actually provide a level playing field um, for everybody to use that data and to have an argument about why certain things are that way and why 
a certain plant intervention may be beneficial for a certain neighborhood or a certain segment of the population in a neighborhood and, and not another one. And I think that's really important. Just to give you an example of something that we did in the past, and I think this morning when Gil was presenting on uh, the Google Airview project that we did in Copenhagen um, that I was involved in, we did the same in Oakland. And there basically uh, it was by providing really open data of high quality that any stakeholder could use and actually take to their policymaker that made a change in Oakland of having an open discussion about why is a certain neighborhood uh, having worse air quality or why does a street have worse air quality and what is basically the reasoning of the government for taking those decisions. So for me, um, these digital tools are only an aid and we hope that we democratize data and algorithms. Thank you. So, thank you, Rob. Now we're just opening it up for questions for any of the speakers. And I promised somebody over there. Um, now you got a first question. There was somebody over there that had a question for the first speaker that I said you could come back to. Have they moved? Where are they? Okay. No, there was somebody. No, 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 no. I didn't. I didn't sanction that. <laughs> 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 um okay the person who had who had that i thought there was somebody over there wasn't that one of you ladies over there okay all right okay i'll just open it up then i'll start with you who um had a second question for the second speaker just raise your hand yeah yeah yes yes <laughs> Hi, thanks so much. So I had a question for Anne. It, as a data scientist, it was really nice to hear about this data-driven approach that you're taking. And um, you mentioned in your talk that change doesn't happen overnight. And one of the ways, one way of affecting change is to focus on capacity building. So I was wondering how the Novartis Foundation is approaching capacity building for AI specialists in the context of Africa, which I'm particularly interested in. Okay. So we'll, could we just take a couple of questions and then we'll just take you in turn. Okay. Second question over there, please. Thank you. My question's also for Anne. Um, yeah, I guess I'd be interested in hearing how a partnership with Microsoft will aim to avoid the pitfalls that have previously occurred with large tech companies and the use of healthcare data, which has been a very sensitive issue. And it's been tripped up on a lot in the past. And the uh, lack of transparency has led to kind of mistrust and patient involvement and obscurity. So I'm just wondering how that partnership is aiming to be transparent and accountable. Okay. We'll bank a couple more. I feel like I've neglected the side of the room. Okay, over there, please. Someone there has the mic. You've got the mic already? Okay, yeah. good on you. Okay. <laughs> and then can you bring the mic down here, please? Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, this question it may be more for Erza, uh, Dr. Erza, if I'm meaning, uh, but maybe anybody. Um, I'm wondering, uh, data only gives you answers that you ask. And are the data revealing any patterns whether achieving social equity actually brings the whole population up uh, in terms of its healthcare outcomes? In other words, are we revealing or could we look for deeper connections between the healthcare outcomes of the disadvantaged and the advantaged? Okay, I'm going to bank them and then I'm going to take you. So take, take note of your questions. Sir? Yes, my question is also related to artificial intelligence. So if any of the speakers would like to answer. So the question is, I, I'm not a data scientist, but I have read somewhere that when algorithms for uh, artificial intelligence are being made, there's biases in the sense of whoever is educating the machine through his or her personal experience, they add a certain preference for how the data is going to spill out the, the outcome of whatever the researcher is doing. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about that, perhaps edu educating us about that particular issue, if there is an issue in how people working in research and doing this type of AI work, how we can be aware of how to actually ask the questions for fair data and fair artificial intelligence so that the inequities that were mentioned that actually could be widened, um, they are actually not widened, but they're closing. Thank you. Okay. So one question over there with a hand up, and then we'll take one more, and then, and then we'll go around and just respond. Yeah, hi, my name is Teresa Reiker, and I'm uh, from the Novartis Foundation as well. And I actually have a question for uh, Hall Fermo Molin, <laughs> sorry, um, and which is around um, your approach with uh, ABMs and simulations. I've got a background in ABMs myself, and I'm wondering um, what is your engagement approach with authorities? How did you, how do you take your technical model and make sure that it is a tool that is a useful? and be also being used in the real world. Okay, I'll take the last question from the gentleman over there because <laughs> you're so enthusiastic, you know, what's, what's not to love about that? <laughs> and then we'll and then we'll come to it. Thank you. Uh, my question is from speaker, first speaker. Uh, actually, uh, Ma'am was presenting regarding the, the electric uh, transformation of uh, uh, vehicles uh, like elect from uh, normal vehicles from uh, like um, petrol vehicles oil vehicles to the uh, uh, electric vehicles so whether this could have been uh, it definitely it will reduce the our car carbon emissions but what about the economic viability because in india our india most more, approximately 50 percent of the tax comes from the petrol say oil say, like uh, so how's economic viable for the government and if suppose uh, most of the government uh, finance like uh, treasury money uh, like uh, this will decrease the government uh, taxes and uh, this will impact on the other electric uh, bill improve in, increase the electric bills ultimately uh, more economic burden to the community so how we study uh, what would the po po political will yeah political stability regarding this okay all right so who would like to go first and i think maybe yeah i can start because i had several questions and i will forget <laughs> but the first one i remember on the request of how we build cap capabilities for um, tech and ai in africa i love that question because it's truly the most important um pillar for uh, advancing countries' readiness to deploy digital technology and AI in their health systems is the capacities, both of the people, the workforce, and the government leaders. So um, we, we definitely do recommend that, and we have in our Broadband Commission report several examples of beautiful countries who have done um, an, a real big step forward in that field. But at the foundation, we we specifically work in Africa, in Central Africa, with our Health Tech Hub Africa, the biggest accelerator based um, in Central Africa, collaboration with Norscom Foundation and the Novartis Foundation, where we host 40 startups from the African continent who develop local solutions to local problems with digital solutions, but also many of them with AI driven solutions. And that um, we host them for one year, build their capabilities of uh, strengthening their model, their, their solutions, strengthening their business plan and helping them uh, at getting rolled out in the public health systems. So that capacity was really in existence, both in the public health system and in the startup world. So by doing it together, building a blueprint for rapid, fast-tracking uh, digital solutions into the public health systems in Africa, that is going to have a huge implication for many African countries. And in fact, it's taking um, now a, a bigger um, sizes by the fact that the, the Smart Africa will take this up and the African Union so that we can do that in many other African countries. But I think 
doing it in practical, in real world, and uh, rolling out digital solutions or AI-driven solutions together with the local authorities, that is the capacity building we, we work towards. And that attracts a lot of um, interest and a lot of partnerships. So that's how we look at it. But I know there's several examples in countries of how governments have set up programs to strengthen capabilities of their people to use digital solutions. And definitely during the COVID pandemic, there's this, there's been this explosion of virtual services. And there, um, obviously, that made a big step, made us advance a big step forward. Then the second question, just quickly about the pitfalls of working with a company like Microsoft. Definitely um, very good question. We work, uh, first of all, with, it's Microsoft AI for Health, which is part of Microsoft Philanthropies. However, uh, all of these initiatives in the data-rich cities, like I mentioned, New York, Lisbon, or man many other cities, is in a uh, very near collaboration or even owned by the local authorities. So first of all, the question we will ask, answer, is determined by the local authorities. We don't come with a proposal. Do you want to know if air pollution is important in your city? We ask the mayor, what is your priority you want to address for the health of your population? And that is the priority we will examine with the health data and the data from the sector that would be um, relevant for answering that question. So the whole um, initiative is owned by the local authorities or the local health authorities or the local health system and is driven by the technical expertise from these partners. The data do not get owned by us, neither by Microsoft. They remain owned by the, um, the current owner. And as much as possible, we will do even federated learning that we leave the data where they are. And otherwise, they would be hosted in um, a secure environment that is specific in the in the cloud that is offered by Microsoft, but specific for this initiative and would be owned by that local authority again. So never by the private sector uh, players. This is what makes this public-private partnership so powerful. And again, I forgot to mention, but we have several of our partners here in the room and tomorrow there's a um, whole panel discussion on this topic and this initiative, AI for Healthy Cities uh, in the Botanical Garden, I think at 10.30, right? Tomorrow morning? Well, at 12. So okay. welcome to hear more about that. You can that. pick up on that. And okay. then the more difficult questions I leave to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's okay. go. Um, well, well, I think the the difficult question, the elephant in the room is basically on on bias and, and data and, and therefore bias in any algorithm, right? If that's mm -hmm. AI or any statistical algorithm, mm -hmm. um, that's absolutely true. Um, and and fair data doesn't solve that, right? I mean, we we can make the, as much as the data uh, findable and accessible, interoperable and reusable, or even open. But if segments of the population uh, are not measured, are not represented in that data set, um, the algorithms of whatever we derive mm -hmm. wouldn't reflect that. And and mm -hmm. within epidemiology, basically, it's about internal and external validity. It's internally valid, right, for the population that you have the data. It might be externally not valid to the population that you apply it to. Um, and so this is one of the concerns that we really have. Um, and I don't have a perfect solution for you. Uh, I would like to have that. Um, and we realize that when we do the studies, also in the Netherlands, when we um, do these in-depth studies where we use sensors and we try to really understand what is happening, um, it's a very selected population. It's by no means representing the Dutch population and mm -hmm. therefore there is a bias. Um, we have to recognize that that bias. We sometimes can correct for it if we actually know what the mm -hmm. selection proportions are from the population. So that's the statistical tools that we can try to do. Uh, but I think we all have to be aware that we try to get um, that data in. And when we don't, that we also don't make basically uh, generalizations to a population where the data is not from. Um, so I think those are the things that we really have to be careful about. AI, and I keep on saying that it's not a panacea, right? It's not it's just a tool that we use when we have loads of variables and things can become complex. It's a way to synthesize the data, but it's not a panacea. And we really have to be careful that we actually don't bring in bias into our disease prediction algorithms, into urban planning by actually having not representative data. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Um, the other question I think was about ABM and and how to to bring that to policymakers. Um, again, I'm going to have a very answer. Sorry, can you spell answer. out? Uh, can you there? spell out your ABM again? Uh, agent based modeling. Um, and so agent based modeling is where we don't take a static digital twin, which loads of cities are using, where you build your city either in a 2D or 3D environment and you layer in your variables on the environment or on housing pricing and that helps policymakers to to look at these and 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 understand basically the city topographies and and uh, things that are uh, playing mm-hmm. a role there um we basically are bouncing off of the digital twinning so um, a lot of municipalities are building their digital twins in the Netherlands at least um where we um are quite organized in in our data uh, and the step there is to say that that's an interesting step, uh, but what it's missing is basically the individuals and the individuals are really where it becomes important because that's where you actually want to have to change and the game. Um, people have choices and that's where we have to basically start developing these models. How we actually um, then um, get acceptance uh, basically within uh, municipality and policymakers is something that I um, don't know. I mean, that's exactly the step that we are trying to make to go from the static digital twins to agents based models to to see basically if that helps to mm-hmm. um, help policymakers to not only understand basically the static aspects of their um, urban environments, but also understand basically the interaction of the people with that environment, mm. but most importantly, to be able to do certifications, understand basically, is this affecting younger children? Is this affecting the elderly? Is this um, mm. leading to health disparities as we just discussed, because it's actually going to be um, that it, it helps the uh, people that are already um, having um, advances over the people that don't have that. And so these are exactly the things that we try to to mm-hmm. answer. If that's going to work, uh, we just have to see. Thank you. And can I add something to the question um, that was thrown to you, Audrey, and uh, address it to both um, Audrey and Shamim? So we'll go to Audrey in the end with Shamim, which is about lessons learned, right? So you've had a couple of questions around unintended consequences, and I wonder if you could reflect on some of the lessons learned when other systems approaches have been taken on how to address that. So I wonder if you pull that in. And for Shamim, um, one of the things that struck me in as much as we saw the rise in the trajectory of the rise in non-communicable diseases and non-communicable disease risk factors over a 10-year trajectory, we also saw a drop and quite a significant drop in some of the infectious um, sanitation, um, hygiene, et cetera. So could you maybe reflect on some of the lessons of what worked and what you think worked in those spaces that could maybe be um, um, cross-pollinated and, and adopted in the NCD world? So start with you and then we'll end with you. All right. So uh, trying to answer the question first on the, um, I think it was something I to do about, uh, the, the, of course, car use generates a revenue for governments and uh, reducing car use then means a dent in the government uh, coffers. And of course, that's, that's uh, uh, an, an issue to be considered, but you also have to think about the costs of not dealing with uh, air pollution, with obesity, with uh, 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 lack of physical activity, of all the NCDs. So it's as long as, and normally does it, is there a, so a cost to, to all the detrimental impacts in terms of healthcare, also uh, having a healthy workforce, uh, attractiveness for tourism, uh, and it's, um, but but that cost is uh, unequally distributed, right? So so it's the, the most vulnerable populations bear the most of that cost. So I think we need to extricate ourselves. And, but of course it's complicated and it's complex and it's and that's where you need to have that uh, thinking. And you're, um, you're completely right to be thinking about this and bringing it up because you have to think about solutions that will uh, that that will deal with this uh, the, the the lack of uh, of, of revenue. Mm-hmm. So. I, 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 that's, uh, my, I guess, my, 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 my short answer, answer to that. But the, the studies that have tried to quantify the cost uh, of any kind of interventions 
um, have, have repeatedly shown that the investments in whether it's air pollution solutions or promotion of uh, walking, cycling, active travel, these the benefits in terms of costs by far outweigh any of the, the, the costs invested into the infrastructure. Of course, there's issues of, of as I was as I was always as was already pointed out in terms of, of the industry impacts and cost revenues, but I think they need to be weighed against all the other mm -hmm. uh, benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the social distribution to bring back to the equity issue that was a, mm -hmm. a question that came uh, uh, as well. I think we need to uh, realize a lot more and think about a lot more the equity and, uh, uh, impacts addressing uh, solutions. So the, it, for example, in air pollution, the people who contribute, the, uh, who bear the most, the, the, the brunt of the, the uh, impacts of air pollution, the ones who contribute less to it. Right. And that's uh, not only is it unequal in terms of impacts, but it's unequal in terms of contributions to this. So this needs to be taken into account. Also bringing back the equity issues in terms of bias. That's why we absolutely need from the start to bring in when we collect data, uh, do a lot more effort of, of co-creation, mm -hmm. have uh, uh, a large part, a part of our funding in, in data collection to go towards specifically trying to find out, making sure that we address those uh, those biases and 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 bring in this um, this issue. And then you lessons learned, lessons mm. learned about what was the question again? Just in other contexts. So in, in, in applying this, um, maybe you can sit with it and come back. Um, oh, we've run out of time actually. So maybe I'll hand over to, yes. yes. <laughs> Shamim will take it in terms of reflecting on lessons learned. Nicely done. <laughs> Shamim, yes. close that, please. I think, you know, in terms of the uh, health perspective, there is a two issues as a public health expert, you know, I think there is one of, you know, healthcare service, then other is, you know, prevention perspective. Mm. So whenever we are talking about, you know, health, you know, our policymakers or managers, they used to understand their, you know, healthcare service. Mm. Now, in terms of the prevention, you know, I think there is a lack of, you know, initiative, and there is a lack of coordination among the different stakeholders, mm. especially multi-stakeholders. Mm. When you know the question came up about the equity, you know, I think that we can ensure the equity in terms of the low-income setting, mm. you know, country, that we have to invest more for the prevention perspective. We have mm. to invest more to understand the you know, risk factor among the policymakers regarding like, you know, for non-communicable disease, if we just build a hospital, that is not the solution. We have to, you know, build a society in a way that there's a full safety. There is a transportation, appropriate transportation and housing system. There is a role of architect and engineer and urban planner. You know, so that perspective needs to be ensured uh, you know, for any long-term policy perspective. Mm -hmm. And finally, in Bangladesh, we started you know, one decade ago that digital Bangladesh. Now we are heading more, you know, forward for smart Bangladesh. And when I was you know, hearing about this you know, AI perspective, I think AI has a big role, but not only for data management or other perspective. I think that AI also has a big role for policy advocacy. Like policymakers, mobile should be more you know, interactive mm -hmm. than what they need to do. Like, mm -hmm. you know, that type of AI may be you know, utilized for mm -hmm. policy ad advocacy and you know, place the policymakers to act properly what they need to, to do by giving the regular knowledge and update, you know, information for them. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of this plenary. There's four, so we were exploring pathways, right, in urban health, and there's maybe four things I want to highlight as, as I heard as cross-cutting as really critical when we're thinking about uh, pathways and for urban health. The first is the importance of considering unintended consequences and really an, a, an, a good advert for why we need the systems approach, right? The second is the importance of participation and consultation, so I'm ensuring your co-design, that's in the context of, of uh, bias, that's in the context of understanding what is necessary in the context of effective advocacy, so importance of buy-in and getting that co-design participation. The third is capacity strengthening, and that has come up 
up again in a couple of with a couple of the of the panelists and the importance of building the capacity along the pathway. And the fourth most important, I think, is the most cross-cutting, is equity. And it's something that as something that we have to be very deliberate about when thinking about building these pathways um, for, for improving urban health. So with that, I'd like to thank you all, um, audience, for being so engaging and um and proactive in interrogating, I mean asking questions of our speakers. And a, a big thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you.